In part two of this week's content on class and education, uh, we're joined by Matthew Munn, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, how the university makes class. So in the previous section, I presented some research I did back from a PhD around uh, young people's orientations towards the future and their ambitions and stuff like that. And I kind of did it in a way that kind of showed that like middle class privileged kids have a kind of different orientation towards the future and in terms of their choices and ambitions, working class kids had kind of more material concerns and more local concerns. So what we'll see in this section is a kind of extension of that in a different research project where similar patterns are happening in higher education. So one of the things we want to talk about, I suppose, and challenge in this section is the very idea of meritocracy and the kind of idea that, you know, um, when kind of working class kids maybe get into university it, it ameliorates kind of class differences, what we find that that's not the case. So uh, we're joined by Matthew today to um, talk about this. Uh, so Matt, tell us a bit about yourself and your research. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my, my res I'm a research fellow here at a place called the Centre of Excellence for Equity in Higher Education. Um, and I work on a series of different issues to do with equity in higher education, mainly the idea that uh, universities have traditionally privileged certain people and uh, prohibited certain people from being able to come through the door, often through things like class and race and gender. Um, uh, I've worked in research in these spaces across you know, direct uh, issues such as social class with, with Steve as well, um, and also issues such as rural, regional, remote, higher education, um, different aspects of uh, uh, public policy, higher educational policy, um, and I'm currently working on a deconstruction of the idea of low socioeconomic status. Right. Um, so lots of different projects yep. in this space. Excellent. So, and what's the centre called? CE. Yeah, CE. That's right. What's it called? Uh, centre <laughs> Centre for Excellence yep. of Equity. Centre of Excellence for Equity in Higher Education. Yep. So you see some publications in the uh, in the readings this week that um, we've written together. So and kind of the Newcastle Youth Studies Centre people have kind of partnered with you guys on a bunch of projects yep. over the years. So uh, one of the things you know, the centre is interested in is equity, and also it kind of engages with the notion of you know the era of widening participation. So can you tell us a bit about what what that is? Yeah, sure. Um, so in Australia, widening participation uh, has sort of started, I mean, issues of, of widening participation have been around for, for quite a while, starting from about the post-war era, uh, trying to bring veterans back from, from um, a war and, and getting them into to things like higher education as a part of a, almost like a re-socialisation. Yep. Um, but the, the current era really started in the 1990s uh, with a, a, a a series of uh, policy reconstructions under the Hawke government by a guy, an education minister called Richard Dawkins. Um, and he was, he first formalised the idea of creating equity in higher education and bringing non-traditional or, or underrepresented groups, i.e. class, gender, race, yeah. etc. Back the then, under, under, underrepresented groups, basically people from working class you know, backgrounds, like university was for the middle class, professional middle class only, really, was it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and and had very low rates of uh, participation for anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, formalised some equity categories of who those people are. There's six categories they, that are still with us today, I might add. They're, they're pretty bad categories, and they're still here, mm. um, which is non-English speaking background, Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander, disability, women in non-traditional areas, low socioeconomic status in rural, regional, remote. Okay. So, um, yeah. Hold on. <laughs> I was yeah. wondering if you're going to remember all six because I, I never can. Um, okay. So, when your participation happens, more people come to the university. Like, historically speaking, what does that mean? What's happened in terms of the idea of how equity or inequality functions? Um, yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, a, a part of these sort of changes, I mean, they're, they're always spruced as like an egalitarian society type idea. But they're underpinned in policy. I mean, if you read the policy, it's really interesting because it can never actually say equity without saying economic productivity or something along those lines. Yep. So this this all comes in, under the era of neoliberalism. I don't know how much you've talked about yeah, it. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, there, there's a, a recrafting of the Australian um, economy towards like a knowledge economy where we start having a much more advanced, uh, you know, uh, productive tech, sort of uh, entrepreneurial sector yep. 
And we move manufacturing and things like that off shore. So what it means is that we have far less of the work traditional working class roles in our society mm -hmm. and that we're increasingly trying to get people into a more uh, knowledge-based um, yeah. basis. So th th there's a bit of a tension in terms of that idea of like a, a, a social justice orientated approach to uh, higher education versus um, just trying to make us more generally economically productive and, and so basically massifying higher education rather than yep. making it about trying to make, for example, parity of participation so people in different groups are getting the same amount of yep. representation in the university. Yep. And so in terms of that social change you've, you've spoken about too, we have kind of looked at the reflexive modernity stuff around how it and, and kind of dovetailing with that period of change in terms of a kind of product economy to a knowledge economy, there's been processes of individualization and stuff like that as well. And what that means, I suppose, is that um, what we consider working class jobs, that stuff of making stuff, working class jobs now are kind of more serving people, yep. that kind of thing. So yep. um, people that don't make it into university um, tend to move into that realm. But um, the research also shows, too, that like, as you were kind of just pointing to then, getting to university then kind of doesn't ameliorate differences. It actually kind of buttresses in many ways, doesn't it? Because backgrounds matter. They matter in terms of what degrees people get into whether they can move to different ones you know who can do the kind of more higher paying ones as opposed to the low paying ones yeah um so the the university kind of refracts class rather than kind of i suppose solves it right yeah yeah absolutely yeah. um and we we in, in australia like while we can talk about all these things like widening participation um, the the areas that people study in is to, is heavily class based and gendered, yeah. um, and uh, the the differences between elite universities versus um, uh, regional universities, the differences between postgraduate versus undergraduate, yeah. uh, all of these things make a huge difference as the way that the class works in terms of yeah. higher education and and what the outcomes that people are likely to be able to experience, yeah. um, and also their their social networks, people's kind of means and understanding where why you come to university yeah there's a really good paper from jesse abrahams who who talks about honorable mobility and the idea that uh working class students are more likely to believe in meritocracy that they they pull themselves up from their own bootstraps mm. meanwhile middle class students are off taking any kind of favor that they can to get the no matter what you know yeah. to, to get them into the place that they think they they're entitled to be in. yeah 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 so, that's right yeah and I suppose it's also important to point out that widening participation hasn't actually led to equity getting into universities either. I mean, as it's kind of says here, middle class kids or whatever, higher economic backgrounds are still three more times likely to go to university. Um, mm -hmm. So there's still all that kind of traditional inequalities about entrance and all that kind of stuff. There may the edges may have been taken off them somewhat, but like there's still they still exist in terms of who goes to university as well. Yeah, it's also interesting that there's not a lot of research about what happens after university, is there? No, not really. Other than done by universities themselves, which are essentially kind of marketing. Um, yeah. That, you know, it's hard to pay heed to those kind of statistics they come up with. Um, so, I mean, project we've done here, we've tried to kind of show before, during and after, I, I suppose. And that's what we're going to talk about um, in a sec. So tell us about this idea of social mobility. Uh, social mobility is the idea of um, uh, that <laughs> it's quite a... a, a it's almost like a stopgap in our society where rather than the idea that we just fix everything so everyone has balance, the idea is that anyone from any position in our society can climb the ladder, in mm. effect. Yeah. Um, and so it means that uh, you, if, if you put in enough time and energy and, and uh, sacrifice, let's call it, if you, say, grow up in a poor area um, in, in, in your parents aren't very well educated or th those sorts of things, there's nothing stopping you in our society from climbing out of that position and into others. Yeah. Um, so it, it sort of works as a stopgap. Yeah. And like it's represented in kind of popular media news and all that kind of stuff. You see the kind of, you know, bootstrap stories of the person with disadvantaged background that kind of makes it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And that's kind of how that meritocracy is represented. But really it kind of blocks out the reality of the fact that like there's literally many more people that try and just can't for all the kind of reasons we're going to point out in a minute. Yeah. The thing that I think is particularly um, important about university study and widening participation is that um, so many people from different backgrounds come to university, try it out for a while and leave, 
And as we know, that that can have a real detrimental sense on their self and the way that they may think of themselves as a failure or whatever, when really they're kind of, you know, set up to fail in terms of what university institutions are. And, um, you know, the way that, you know, people from disadvantaged backgrounds often, you know, have to work full time or look after people or travel two hours to get here and all that kind of stuff that like are essentially structural constraints on the very possibility of like engaging with an institution like this in a kind of equitable manner. Yeah. And like, so people do pull themselves up by the bootstraps, you know, yeah. the odd one or two, like, you know what I mean? Or three or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Like, but like when it comes to the kind of economy of scale here, that's really not how it works. It's misrepresented through those kind of um, examples. So we are kind of fundamentally kind of challenging the idea of meritocracy here. This thing that, you know, if you, if you work hard enough and you're talented enough, you're right to the top. Elements of that are certainly true in some respects, but really what we can show time and time again, and like any independent study that kind of takes into this disadvantage into account, shows that like people have very different starting points and more weapons to be able to kind of move through that field than others. So um, that's what we're going to kind of talk about here. The other thing I want to briefly talk about too, it's not that middle-class kids don't work hard yeah. and don't aren't anxious and precarious because that is moving up the scale. They tend to just have kind of qualitatively subjective differences in what their worries and cares are about that are kind of less material for a start and more about ambitions and um, and passions and stuff like that that like we looked at with we'll look at with um, Dave Farouge's work about about how young people become um, workers. So let's talk about some of the data. Um, here we've got some example from two examples um, about uh, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds and their experiences in the education programs. So can you tell us a bit about what these um, people are saying? Yeah. Um, so one, I mean, some of the things that are actually being talked about there is also is, uh, you know, it's sort of got a title, Effective Violence. It's 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 an aspect of sort of being told whereabouts you, you sit within our society, you know, the idea of, you know, for example, in that quote there from Lenin, you know, get a job and don't be on welfare is how she's sort of unpacking what you know, the idea of yeah. running in programs in, in high school. Yeah. Uh, that call, you know, put your hand up, not your hand out. I mean, yeah. like the symbolic violence of that is just baked in. Yeah. And it's, it's that's not going to be offered in, in like a, a elite private school. No one's doing that there. Yeah. So it's already assuming this idea and stigma, you know, it's setting up a symbolic violence around certain areas, certain schools. Yeah. Um, and, and and telling, you know, a reinforcement of what those students mm. actually kind of uh, confirming of their social position of like, oh, that's right. This is where I belong. That's yeah. how I sit within our society. And that therefore affects their kind of horizons and possibilities. They kind of, you know, adjust their ambitions accordingly. So um, in the second quote there, we have a kind of example of inequality that happens within a school in a way in the sense that Carrie here points out that like she argues that the teachers kind of sort it out very quickly the, the kids they were kind of look after the more academic the apparently good ones the more swatty ones she wasn't like that she was obviously pretty smart though but like yeah. she was felt tr treated badly by uh, teachers so again these kind of everyday social relations that happen within school kind of have class hierarchies embedded in them and people feel that and kind of adjust the way that they kind of think and feel and behave in the world accordingly. Um, what about the university one? Like we had a lot of uh, data around kind of symbolic violence between students in terms of the degree they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Look, it's, it's an interesting one. And, and you were sort of talking before about like, you know, how people have different kinds of worries and concerns and so on. And uh, you, you sort of see like, for example, the anxiety about um, networking or the, the anxiety about when and how you apply for a job. You see, these are very class things because people are learning about those processes yep. during their socialisation. They're seeing it in the people around them. For example, I mean, I'm a working class guy and I grew up with the idea that you just go and get something like a, a trade hmm. and uh, and then you just go to work and work is that thing that you do when you're at work. You don't yep. bring it home. You don't go to networking functions to, to try and land yourself in your next position. Or, it's not something you invest your whole life in. No, no. It's exactly. a part of your life to actually have a life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it, as soon as you're out of that space, it, it, that turns it off. And so it, most of these other things, you know, the idea that you're actually having to put so much time and energy into producing your social position, 
is, is something that I, we saw in the sort of data that that you know people, for example, in this quote from Daphne, it, it, it's a it's a really hard thing to do, but also it's a really challenging you know foreign sort of idea, yeah. and that as as she's suggesting there it could just come across like a waste of time. And, yeah. and so you can't actually see the outcome, the meaning that the actual, the value of these things aren't yeah. well understood. And what's ironic about that is Daphne's likely to be like, you know, doing social science, likely to be first in family at university. A family's like to see her going to university as an achievement. Yeah, yeah. Middle-class kids doing other degrees and kind of saying, what are you doing that for? That's not even a real degree kind of thing. So you still have that kind of hierarchy of degrees within it. Yeah. Even though we know that kind of, let's say very clearly here, not just being cloak, uh, parochial, that the social science degree has really great um, vocational outcomes. So yeah. the, a lot of these kind of hierarchies and myths don't actually, you know, uh, relate to the reality of, of no, who gets what. Don't. Yeah. Don't, for sure. So in this one, it's, this is like a, a couple of more privileged kids um, experience kind of affinity with this place. So rather than kind of feeling out of place and experiencing these kind of forms of symbolic violence, um, these examples show a much more affinity with what goes on in the education space. So can you tell us a little bit about them? Um, yeah, almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's interesting. That that one from, from Lucy at the top, it's it's an interesting one because what she's talking about is that that sense of like the fish and water thing that Borgia talks about, that sense of... Um, uh, mm. it, it, was, it was something that could just happen. Mm. You know, that, that it was... You know, yeah, I, she just had to be who she was. Yep. There was no transition. There's no transformation of how she's actually performing in the world. But like e each thing feels like a sort of fluid step yep. uh, along the path. To the point where you can have a year off. Yeah. Yeah. Year. Yeah. Yep. So again, with the kids with material concerns, we're talking about gap years. Yeah. Um, the second one kind of goes through almost a laundry list of what privilege looks like. Yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't want to have to work full time or anything like that. Well, you didn't have to. Your parents looked after you. I wanted to go to Europe. Um, living at home, you know, they can live at home. That's a huge advantage to be able to kind of financially set yourself up. Obviously, kids from distance and um, kids with other issues that have to move out of home can't do that. Um, you don't have to cook dinner. You don't have to pay for food. Um, this is a very much expression of kind of a privileged middle, middle class habitus that I would say a lot of students even seeing this take for granted. They wouldn't actually be thinking about their own lives as being privileged because you're kind of living at home with your parents and going to uni. Yeah, but, yeah. But exactly. as our research shows, it, it really is. So um, that, can be, that can be challenging for students to kind of, uh, well, hang on, I'm not privileged, but like in the hierarchy of what's going on here, that's a privilege. Yeah, and, and those those narratives, like, I mean, in the affect part, like, you know, what she's, you know, there's no friction. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. I mean, she's not going up against her parents who are telling her, like, like, you know, you think you're better than us now. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you see that a lot in the, the data that, you know, some uh, kids, are, when they're at uni, like their their old friends don't want anything to do with them yeah. versus, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, There's a lot of research about the kind of, um, is it worth the, that kind of social um, stuff for them? Like, and they feel like they're spraying up whether like I'm jettisoning my connections here to my old life and now I have to make a new life and there's a real kind of issue around that, yeah. Yeah. The other thing that was really important and students will be kind of feeling this in their own degrees now as well is the need for networking and the need for kind of work experience and internships. Um, and so again, we have a kind of more uh, privileged students here that are kind of talking about that as oh, they're just doing it, right? It's just some stuff that you do. Um, again, it's much easier to have an internship if you're financially supported and it's actually easier to get the good ones when you have the social capital to know the right people. And so, yeah, Ernie in particular kind of mapped it out, didn't he? Oh, yeah, that that's right. And and you could actually use sh students that, that were more supported often had like you know a plan coming in, and in their first year they were generating plans for their fourth year. Yeah. And I mean that that was quite shocking to me. I was seeing because, for example, having to sort of load up parts of their their semesters and do more work so that they gave themselves more time to do things like apply for jobs. Yeah. And, or and go, on, go on international trips and all yep. that kind of thing to yep. kind of get that capital. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just on that, I mean, one of the things that you see is actually this sort of, um, you know, on the class thing, you know, is uh, for working class kids, as we talked about before, there's often that sort of sense of being a, a, an actual, um, uh, you know, you, you, your life is not your job. Mm. You you walk away from it at the end of the day, but there, there's a lot of this that you know some of the things that you're doing in the way that you think, oh, I might 
go and uh, try and you know be the president of one of the clubs on campus or whatever because that'll look good on my CV. That so many of these sorts of things become integrated and the the difference between work and self are really blurry. Yeah. Um, and so you can sort of see in these examples where people are actually having to see themselves. In, in, there's no separation between those two states. There's yeah. you, you're you're planning yourself and building out those things because that's who you are. Mm-hmm. And networking and things like that. They're not an effort. You, you the things you enjoy are also a part of your your you know um, uh, employability in a sense. Yeah, employability. Yeah, that's a key term. It kind of comes up a lot. Yeah. Okay. Um, so then this is a, a kind of contrasting example with a student here that like, you know, this is at a time when the work integrated learning stuff is just starting to be introduced and like, wasn't sure if it was worth it. Right. Because, you know, um, it's elective. If it wasn't explained that well, um, kind of assumed to be just more figuring it out. They kind of have more material concerns in that sense as well. Um, again, the kind of networking aspect, aspect is much less normalized for the kind of student that um, doesn't have those kind of family contacts. Um, where, as you pointed out, the middle class kids are just kind of often almost frantically networking, going to events and all that kind of stuff to to meet people. Yeah. Okay, to sum up. So, yeah, do you want to kind of um, sum up your kind of thoughts on on this research? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because I, I think that ultimately higher education institutions are... A, a thing that you know as you said refract they 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 can be used to launder um people's privilege you go through the system and you've already started with a bunch of privileges that then get turned into a form of um capital that on the other side it looks like you're the one who achieved all of that mm-hmm. and it, it sort of um almost uh I don't want to obliterate too big a word, but it, it makes it hard to see all of the support you got along the way. Yeah. And so we take it in as this individual essence, whether it's um, intelligence or charisma or um, yeah, IQ. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you can sort of see through these processes that we end up um, just using the, the universities that can, can be used and we can put working class kids into it and then demonstrate it's like, see, the middle class is actually still... Um, the people who deserve these uh, these more prestigious roles, the more um, uh, you know, the better career paths or whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Um, and it's so widening participation as a sort of policy suite has actually really just recreated um, class, uh, old ideas about class in Australian society. It's just shifted them from between the university on the outside and the inside to just being ha- happening and refracting within the institution itself. Yeah, rather, and you can see critique of white participation from the kind of right side of politics is actually moving towards making it more elite again. Yeah. Kind of using the notion that kind of disadvantaged kids don't do as well as kind of data that they shouldn't be there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And so, like, it's a very interesting kind of development that in a way. Um, and again, I would argue you can see introduction into this university with the kind of first year of um, compulsory attendance. You know, someone saw a graph where, you know, more attendance equals more success, which, yeah. like... On the whole represents something but it represents nothing about the difference in young people's lives going to university you know, whether you have to travel whether you have to work and all that kind of stuff so attendance isn't just a given you know no. for many students they have to kind of struggle to get here in the first place even once they've got in so those kind of class ideas are kind of written out of these policies yep. um that therefore in a like kind of institutional setting embed inequalities in them despite all the rhetoric about like addressing them yeah yeah absolutely yeah um, okay, um, we're running out of time, so um, thanks, Matt, for joining me today, um, and I'll leave this part of the uh, lecture there. Thank you. <laughs>